Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. What's up? This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got Patrick Vellner on the show. Pat is a three-time CrossFit Games athlete. He placed third in 2016 and 17, and second this past year in the 2017 season. He's one of the most consistent athletes in the sports history, and the reason that I've been so excited to connect with him is that he's one of the most calculated athletes, and I I get this sense that there's more going on upstairs, meaning he pays attention more to his mindset than most of, if not all of the other athletes. So I was really pumped to connect with and talk to him. Obviously, we talk about his evolution over the past three years, going from kind of accidentally qualifying for the games and then placing third his first year he just completely came out of nowhere and it was a surprise to him as much as it was anyone else and we talk about how he went from that guy to him being touted as going to beat Fraser this year and specifically what he changed to get there and we talk about the big especially the big mental shifts that he's made along the way. Um, he talks about why Frazier has been so dominant over the past few years and exactly how he can beat Frazier. And then finally, we talk about all of the new changes that um, CrossFit is making to the CrossFit Games and what he and his fellow athletes think of it and his plans for the future. This one was a pleasure for me. I hope you get as much out of it as I did. Enjoy the show. Patrick Vellner, what's up, brother? Not much, my man. How you doing? Doing great. Thank you for joining me, dude. I know um, this is oftentimes a really busy time for elite athletes, and I appreciate you carving out some time to do this with me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So Brent Fakowski begged me to start the podcast like this. He has a, an essential question for you. Why are you not as free nor as brave as Americans? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think it may lie somewhere in our social obligation to take care of each other. Some people call it socialism, but I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I I texted her. I was like, give me, give me like a great inside joke to, to start this thing off. And he really, it sounds like you really let me down here. Oh no. We, we taught, we made that joke so many times at the games. Just, I don't know. (laughs) We wish we could be as free and brave. Oh yeah. So we started doing this thing recently where we poll our audience for some questions for guests and stuff like that. And a lot of people asked some similar, some very similar questions. And the, what they asked more than anything were things like this, um, at Boulevard, Ivan said, can he sing as well, as well as Ed Sheeran? Isaac store said, will he do a chest wax for charity? Jada McManara says, what kind of sunscreen does he use? And then finally, <laughs> Dallin Pepper says, how does he keep his beautiful pasty white complexion? So Conor McGregor in the UFC, he's created this like alter ego or this caricature of himself. And is this, are you creating some kind of character of yourself in CrossFit, the pasty white Canadian Ed Sheeran phenom athlete? <laughs> I don't know if I've done that myself or if the, the CrossFit world has done that for me. Um, I think I, I don't dispel that stuff. I'm just sort of let it ride and roll with the punches. But uh, at a certain point, you just have to own it. Like, yeah, I'm not, what am I going to do? Go get a sweet spray tan before the games and right. try to like, I don't know. That's just the way I am. I'm uh, I'm 28 years old and I'm at peace with it. So uh, the Ed Sheeran on stuff is kind of, oh, I mean, I think when you posting on social media and doing all that stuff and looking at the photos, like, yeah, you have to, you have to, to throw the odd jab at yourself out there and self deprecate a little bit. But, um, no, I'm definitely, and I've had conversations with the media teams where they laugh and say, you know, when we shoot events, we either have to shoot you or everybody else. Cause otherwise the contrast is way out of whack. <laughs> so <laughs> it's nice. funny. I mean, you, That's messed yeah. up, man. It's like, fair enough guys. Like, I don't know. Sorry. I'll try it. to be better it. next year, but it's either, it's either red or white for me. I think that's hilarious. Like Canadian. 
So before we really dive into CrossFit, CrossFit games, all of that stuff, um, I'd like to humanize you a little bit and, you know, let people remember that you're more than just an Ed Sheeran phenom athlete. <laughs> <laughs> and go into your past a little bit. So sure. before the show, you you mentioned uh, a really challenging time in your life. Uh, it was 2012, and you moved across the country. You know, it was the furthest away you'd ever been from your family. Can you talk a little bit about that time of your life? Yeah. So I I grew up in not a very big city in central Alberta, like sort of little ways off the mountains, a town called Red Deer, which like my old family, my family's all there and, and most of them are still there. Um, but we have a pretty small community there that like everyone, everyone knows like my family, people are all kind of fairly tight. Um, but I, I just kind of decided when I was in school that, um, whether or not it was going to be permanent when I over for the duration of my education, I kind of wanted to go somewhere else. So when I retired from gymnastics and I was deciding I was going to go to and go to university and, and pursue an education, I figured if you're going to be a broke student, you might as well go do it somewhere new and do it somewhere exciting and just like go live a different life for a little bit. So, uh, I had initially, I moved to Vancouver very briefly and did a little bit of school there. And then I came back home to work for a little bit. Uh, and then I packed up and moved to Montreal for my bachelor's degree, which was give, super just cool. To give people a little bit of uh, geographical context. Vancouver's all the way on the west coast. Montreal yeah. all the way on the east coast. Yeah, not quite coastal for Montreal, but much farther. Like the Vancouver to Montreal is probably a five-hour flight mm -hmm. uh, straight east. So, um, like just like in the U.S., Canada's a big place. Like you go, you go left or right, and things are going really far. So, um, Montreal was fun. I, I did my my. Um, early education all in French immersion but there's not much French back home uh, you sort of do that in school and then as soon as you graduate if you don't work in a job like a, like a teacher that teaches French immersion there's not a lot of opportunity it's just a you get a cool bilingual certificate and you, you're a little bit have an advantage when it comes to hiring but uh, I took advantage of that and I, I moved to Montreal and I used my French a little more and I did an education there and it was fun it was cool to live in another city and and like I said, live a different experience, but you do leave a lot behind. And when you do that, um, it's now been right when I finished that degree, I started another one in Toronto, which is uh, still much farther east than home. And uh, it's been probably eight, nine years since I've lived back west. Um, and yeah, it's tough. Like you, you, you leave a lot of your roots there and like all my friends I grew up with, all my family, and you have to build a new network from, from the ground up, right? So uh, it's an exciting opportunity and you get to – you can rebuild and reinvent your life as you see fit, but um, there is there is a lot of comfort at home, and uh, you certainly leave something behind when you move. So uh, it's been a challenge to just try to stay close with your family. I think you have to really make the extra effort. Um, you lose out a lot not being able to see them every day, or uh, it's easy to forget to call or to to go two three weeks without touching base when you're that sort of thing is right in front of you, right? Um, you sort of it's easy to fall into this out of sight, out of mind kind of trap. Um, so it's been challenging. And, and fortunately, my family's very supportive. Like since I've been competing in CrossFit, my folks will come out to the regionals and the games every year. And um, I make a point that every time they're there, we'll we'll make sure we kind of have every meal together and spend our time and uh, appreciate that time and really get some, some quality visits in uh, when we have the chance. Because sometimes it could be months or a year before the next one right so um it's been good it's been good my family's been great but uh, that's certainly a challenge so i think it's anybody who's ever moved away from home would probably tell you the same certainly man i can absolutely relate to that now is i didn't realize you lived in montreal or had like french roots does that have anything to do with your with michelle coaching you your coach michelle uh probably indirectly i think so I, I mean, indirectly, because I, part of the reason I chose moving to Montreal was to try to preserve my French. Like I said, I didn't, there's not much opportunity back home. Um, so, and Montreal is actually a fairly English city in the downtown core it, in the sense that if you don't speak French, everybody else can probably speak English, uh, if they work downtown. So the farther you get away from downtown Montreal, the less that's the case. But I started going to school there, and I started CrossFit while I was there. I met some friends at school that I started with. And um, after my first regional, I met a coach and, and started training at a gym that was kind of 
a 20 minute walk, 30 minute walk from where I was living. Was that the gym I um, met you at? No, that's oh, the gym yeah. I'm at now. That was in, that's in Toronto. Okay, got it. Um, so Montreal, the gym I was at was in a, an area called the Plateau, which is a fairly French section of Montreal. Um, so I eventually started coaching there a little bit and all the classes were coached in French. So I had to sort of like really practice my French at that point. And that was great. I mean, it, forceful immersion is the best way to learn anything. Um, and that gym at the time was the gym that Michelle was involved with. She was, I think, a part owner there. So I met her and, and trained a little bit with her. I, I wasn't anything exceptional at the time, but um, she was very nice and, and uh, got to know her a little bit. And then the year 2016, when I qualified as an individual, um, I was still living in Montreal that summer, just living kind of at my girlfriend's place while she went to school uh, in Montreal at the, at the time as well. So we were training, I was training for the games and she was training for the games, but she was now had moved to a gym a little bit farther north uh, of the city where she still is, uh, which is Decker CrossFit. And uh, anyways, long, like long story short, my girlfriend ended up switching programs and was moving. So I ended up needing a place to stay and Michelle and her boyfriend Fred offered up that I stay at their place and uh, just train with her for the games. Uh, for 2016 so i spent about a month living with michelle and training with her every day uh and then that game season obviously went very well i finished in third and she we competed on the invitational team together that uh next off season and then she retired shortly thereafter and launched her programming so when she launched her programming for decacomp um I got in touch with her and just said that I would love to continue to work with her. I thought that we had a, a great time and we got along very well. So um, that's how that started. And I've been with her ever since. So it's worked out very well. And I think it was just a kind of a, a lucky set of circumstances that I I kind of fell into this gym and met her. And then through some other circumstances, I ended up living with her and training with her. And we built a good relationship and a good foundation for what we now have. So it was cool. So is she helping you preserve your French? Do you also, what language do you all speak? Well, we speak English mostly together. It's sort of funny. I, I've told I've told this to a few people before, but when you, like, when you meet someone and you speak with them, kind of like whatever whatever language you form that relationship in initially, tends to be the way you you speak with them. Um, so when I first met her, I was sort of like, I was not coaching at that gym yet. Was still kind of like getting my French back. I hadn't really gotten a whole a uh, whole bunch of my my French rolling again, and then. Uh, so we just spoke English together and she knew I was like an Anglophone speaker, an English speaker. So, um, now when I go to her gym where she is outside of Montreal, I mean, everyone speaks French there. There's very little English in that gym unless they have people visiting. So when we're there with her members and, and her classes, and if I go for a training camp, we speak French just because everyone else speaks French and that's just how it is. But, uh, if I were just staying at her house and it was just her and I, we would speak English just because that's kind of like how we we formed that relationship and how we, we learned to speak with each other. So it's funny. I mean, this year Laura Horbath was down training for the games and, um, she doesn't speak any French obviously, but in the gym, like everyone still just speaks French unless they're directly speaking to her, like people speak in English. So it's funny. Like it, it, you, we speak English together unless we're with other French speakers. So, uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of funny. We'll, we'll be a little bit back and forth. And I mean, that's also helped me keep my French, good is that when i when i speak uh when i i sort of like started crossfit in the french community in in montreal so most of the athletes that i knew going into regionals or whatever are all french speakers um like alex vigno like caroline recent all all them paul tremblay even is very french so we uh we i speak a lot of french in the crossfit world and then outside of that not really and I remember actually, I think when we did the open announcement in 2017, Brent and I did it and it was in Montreal. Um, so I, there was a lot of the French community around that I knew and I spoke French with. And um, I think Rory McKernan at one of the dinners complimented me on my English. And he said that like, you know, he's like, wow, your English is actually really good. Like, um, <laughs> like you don't, I think he's you're accustomed to hearing like Camille's French accent and stuff. And so he actually commended me on my English and I had to tell him that thanks very much. I've been speaking it my whole life <laughs> and uh it's funny right like i think you just sort of the crossfit world for maybe the start of my exposure at the games level um may have thought that i was a, a native 
Quebecois right, athlete right. because that's where I competed and, and ever since anybody knew of me that's where I was uh, and you see like the odd video where I'm speaking with Michelle or Albert or, or Alex or somebody and I'm speaking in French to them so yeah I can totally see why but uh, I thought it was pretty funny because yeah, I'm like where I grew up is very not French <laughs> so right, right yeah you should have snapped back at him y- yours is really good too man congratulations yeah, yeah. solid work in, in practicing no in practicing at all <laughs> yeah so where did I meet you? CrossFit Solid Ground, right? Yeah, that's so that's what I'm still training, yeah, in okay. uh, in North York, Markham area, uh, Toronto. Okay, so the first conversation that we ever had, it was, let's say, a month out from regionals, and you had just won, I think it was 2016, yeah, or 15? I think it was 2016. You not I made think it to the games yet. I think I had not qualified to the games as an individual. So you had won the region, the Canada East region, in the open and the conversation that we had went something like you were, you were really, really nervous that you would be one of those guys that did really well in the open, but couldn't make it past regionals. And I remember thinking, you know, that's, that's interesting. He's probably going to be one of those guys. Like he doesn't have any experience at the games and they, this is a um, amazing region. He's probably going to be one of those guys. And you were, you were working really hard on your, Olympic lifts and you were not one of the best. <laughs> if I remember correctly, you were not, you were not, um, you were not nearly as strong as the very top guys, right? It's still not. And then you went in there and crushed it at the regional, but then you went to the games and got third place. So from my perspective, it was like, holy shit, this guy just like accidentally got third place at, at the games. What, Give us, give me some of the, like what happened in the years before and was there, was there a vision that one day you might compete for a podium spot, uh, and to win the CrossFit games? I don't think initially, I think goals evolve and that's kind of, it's a dangerous way to look at things. Like when I, that year I remember starting the open and I mean, priorities were make the regionals again. Uh, I qualified the year before obviously and I went I chose to go team and then competed in the games as a team and the next year was like all right I'm gonna go back individual plan is make it to the regional first and foremost try to make it in qualify in one of the top heats to give yourself a good advantage and then we'll, we'll go from there and then I mean early on in the open or like after two weeks three weeks I was still top 10 or something in the world and I it was surprising to me and I felt like I kept expecting something to like, ah, yeah, this is cool, but I mean, next week something's going to come up and it's going to knock me down. And nothing ever did. And I I sort of felt like I, I, I overperformed a little bit in the open in certain areas. Like there was a heavy clean workout in that year that I like, I finished and I didn't expect to, not by a long shot. Over, you thought um, you overperformed. Like you weren't yeah, actually yeah. capable of that. Yeah. And I think but that that's, I mean, that's something that a lot of, athletes deal with and it's hard to know particularly when you train in a vacuum like I don't have other athletes around to compare myself against I don't compete a lot in the off season so you end up doing a lot of work by yourself and you're just you're racing ghosts and it's hard to know where you sit when you come into a competition like that so even coming into the open you you look and you're like all right geez still every year last year I remember coming to the open and thinking like man I hope I'm fit enough because everyone's just getting better and it's not you don't know like you don't know where everyone is and I I think that whenever I approach a competition I expect to see the best version of every athlete out there on the competition floor and like that's what I envision when when I take the floor so maybe that gives me an advantage in terms of preparation that like I'm preparing to beat the best version of you that you could possibly put onto the floor so like that's the that's the what I'm looking for and so if anything less shows up then I'm going to pummel you but if, I, if if the best version of you does hit the floor, like I'm trying to be prepared for that. Mm-hmm. So I think that in 2016, I mean, I was still like, I'm, I've been slowly improving on things like my weightlifting, my strength, but that was obviously a weakness. And at regional levels programming, when things get a little heavier and a little harder, I tend to do very well at the high skill workouts, but the heavy weights sometimes give me problems. So I was prepared to take a hit in one or two workouts and then uh, try to win a couple maybe. Um, but again, you don't know. And I, I knew that the East Regional was a, a very strong region. And it's, I think that's just how you have to be prepared for it. Like, you can't let that deflate you or, or defeat you. But you just have to be like, man, if, if they're going to be this good, I better be that good or better, right? So, um, 
I don't think there's anything wrong with approaching a competition that way. I don't I ever walk into a competition expecting to win it, but I, I want to win it. And I think I fear not winning it. And I think that that's, a, to me, that's a good way to train because if I'm thinking about the worst case scenarios, I prepare for them and I am able to like, to rally if something goes wrong or I know I've already envisioned all those scenarios so I know what to do whereas if you're just like constantly thinking no I'm going to walk in and everything's going to go great as soon as something doesn't go great you don't know what to do anymore you're thrown off balance right um so yeah I don't know 16 was it was a surprising year I think that I again I, I went into the regional not knowing what to expect I actually hurt myself at the start of that regional I tore my bicep in the first event and then uh that was a bit destabilizing to say the least but Beyond that, I mean, after that had happened, you had to sort of do it one event at a time. I, I was too focused on the outcome, I think, early. Uh, and that brought me a feet back on the ground and made me think, all right, like one event at a time, just do whatever you can do and move through the event okay. And then once that was done, I think, I, I, again, I didn't, I didn't picture myself as being a podium performer at the games, but I was excited to, to try the games level programming. I think there's certain things at the games level that... Um, that I, I have an advantage on just with my athletic background. And um, so I was, I was excited to just like throw my hat in the ring and try that out. So there was, and I, I think another thing that I got an advantage from was competing in the East Regional, you get to compete against Matt from halfway through the season. So I got to see what the level was, what the highest level was long before anybody else did. And then when I got to the games, I just remember being, after the ranch day, I was still in the top heat. And then for the rest, I was in the top heat all weekend, and it was just like it was just like regionals. It was like, okay, there's Matt. Try to stay as close to Matt as you can. And then like it was the same. And I just like I would do well enough, finish top ten in most of the events, I think. And over the course of fifteen events, like that's all you need. Um, but moving past that, I think it was important the next year to try to figure out how to be a little bit more aggressive and how to to approach certain events thinking like, all right, I'm not going to try to stay close. I have to try to win. I have to try to push other people to make decisions maybe that they don't want to make. Um, and so that was sort of a growing period in the last like couple years is, is trying to develop that confidence because in the past, that's just sort of like, I just flow through it and I try to like not just try to not screw up. And I think that it's been a, a learning process to try to own that performance a little bit and say, Hey, like I am, this good and i think that i can push other people and destabilize them and make and like I said make other people take risks and uh, do things that they don't want to do to try to beat you um so it's fun you sort of learn how to play the game a little bit uh and this year in particular at the regional level i had a lot of fun doing that um and it just like i don't know things things have happened in the last couple of years that have gone well and poorly and whatever i've, I've faced a lot of different things i've <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think in one thing that I always do is I manage to write write the ship and and find the the best way for me to get through the competition and I, I don't get I don't get knocked off balance for long. So uh, anyway, it's been it's been interesting. It was I certainly didn't start in 2016 expecting to be where I am now, but um, I think yeah the the goals have evolved over time and it's I think that now now that's the goal. Like I wouldn't be happy with anything less than finishing on the podium or. Um, competing for the top spot. Right. I mean, you've certainly um, answered to adversity extremely well, whether it be something like the cargo net and just like not skipping a beat this year, or if it's like an entire event, like your chain gets knocked off. Um, you have this ability to accept what's already happened and just give, put your best foot forward and you don't complain. You don't, it, well, at least that the public sees you don't complain you don't feel woe is me and you accept it and just move on which is tremendous now is it in 2017 i didn't really notice the aggression but it could have been because i wasn't really watching you right in 20 after 2017 it's like okay this dude is for real he's competing for the, the top spot and all eyes were on you to beat Matt this past year. And so I was definitely more focused on you and I really noticed the aggression. Did anything switch in your mind? Was was there any significant shift in your mind going from 2017 to 2018? Yeah. So I think the, sh the change was in, from 16 to 17. Um, 
in 2016, like you're right, I showed up and I like I accidentally landed on the podium, and it was. Uh, I, I think I wasn't sure how to how to take that uh, at the time, and going into 2017, I think that that was still a lingering thought that I had was like, man, I don't know, was the programming great for me? Did I get a bit lucky? Like, did, was this just a series of events that led to like the the best outcome? And I still think that in 2016, I think I, that was the best games competition that i have had to date uh, in terms of like performing to my max potential i think that that was the best outcome i could have hoped for that year anytime i had an event where i could do well i did and anytime i had an event that i needed to do damage control on i did it to the very best of my ability um and i really didn't miss at all uh and then in 2017 coming in i felt like I think I felt a little more pressure and I put a little pressure on myself to think like, Hey, well, like you need to prove that you belong in that top class of the sport. And now, um, I was a much more complete athlete at the time. And I just, I took some risks that didn't pay off. And I think I, I made some decisions that like what that led, led to mistakes. Well, like even right off the bat, like I, I got caught racing too much in the water at the, in the first event, uh, being not the strongest swimmer. I ran too fast cause I'm a good runner. And then I tried to be near the front, but that, because I, again, I kept my focus on like, you need to be near the front in the run. Like you're one of the better runners to do that, but everybody else ran too fast. So to be near the front in a pack that's running too fast is still a bad decision. Right. And I didn't I didn't have that control. I think I made a very amateurish mistake. And then when I got to the water, I was going to try to like dial it back a bit, recover for maybe the first 100 meters. And I just swam probably maybe 25 meters and then told myself like you're in a race, like you need to race. And then by like 300 meters in, I was completely wrecked and like cramping up and was just like lost it. So that was a frustrating mistake to make. Uh, especially in the first event and the difference maybe between 16 and 18 and 17 is that in 2017, um, I didn't have the performances in the first day to put myself back in the top heat on day one. So I didn't even make it to the top heat till like day two or three or something like that. Um, and so I was constantly trying to fight back to gain that heat advantage, which is challenging. And it's something I think that you maybe take for granted if you're in the top heat, but it's a significant advantage. And, uh, so that, like I did that in the swim, I had a crash in the cycle cross. Um, like I took a, maybe a risky jump on the snatch and I missed my second snatch. Um, I just had like a, a lot of different things happen where as soon as it felt like I gained some momentum again, I would, something would just totally shatter it and I'd finish like 20 something in an event again. Um, which is something that I didn't do this year or in 2016. So I don't know. I don't know if it was, I tried to make some moves and they were, they were poorly calculated or what, but, um, looking back on it, I can clearly identify several places where I, I made decisions that did not pay off. Um, and this year there was less of that. Uh, I think again, I had a lot of execution errors this year, um, that lost me maybe a handful of places in, in a handful of events, but, and some of them were spectacular, like the cargo net and the bike and the, my plate rolling away in the last event, like there were many of those, but I mean, th those were less significant in terms of other than the bike, uh, that cost me only a handful of places and like maybe a, a little skin off my back. But the, uh, at the end of the day, it wasn't so bad. They were just frustrating because I know that had I not done some of those things, I could have really tightened up the competition a lot. Uh, and I felt like it was not representative of the potential that I had this year. I mean, outcomes are great. I finished second and I feel like I deserved to finish second, but there was a lot that I left on the table. I feel like, and I was, I left a bit frustrated, uh, with how I executed certain events and how I'm making silly mistakes that are uncharacteristic for me. So I think that I felt a little bit of those eyes on, like you say this year. Um, and I need to figure that out and deal with it a little bit. I, I actually had, I remember after everything was done this year, uh, at the last, uh, at the dinner, I think, um, Dave came over and I was like having a drink with my parents and chat with them. And Dave comes over and, He's like, oh, like, good job, congratulations. And he said, I remember in 2016, he said, that, or, or maybe it was 17, I don't remember. He went, he made some comments somewhere saying that he thought that I was one of the only guys out there that could beat Matt uh, in the men's field. And so he basically came over to the table to reiterate that to me and say, he's like, hey, Velner, like, uh, 
great job this week. You did a lot of crazy stuff. Um, I, I know I said this to you like a year or two ago, and I still believe that right now you're the only guy in the field that can beat Matt. Wow. But you need to, you need to unfuck yourself and do it. <laughs> his, his exact words. And I, all I could do is look at him and be like, you're absolutely right. Like I was my own worst enemy all year this year at the games. And I mean, I just, I, there's a lot of things I need to, to reel in and, I, I'm fully aware of it. That was there was a lot of things totally inside my control that I just I just screwed up. Um, so that's on me, and I know that. And that's I'm not going to make any excuses over anything. Like I made mistakes, and everybody makes mistakes. If I get to fix mine, so does everybody else, and the and the competition sure. changes drastically. So you can't sit there and think of what could have been, but um, you you can do whatever you can do to make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, so that's the plan right now, and I think that. Like I said, I was I was happy with how things turned out this year, but there was a lot that I felt like I left on the table, and it's it's I mean it's up to me to not let it happen again is the thing, right? With all of that said, and I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more with what Dave said. Um, but the fact still is that over the past three years, Matt has had a dominant performance. If you look at just the points, do you have any um, like why do you think that is? Well, for one thing, he's an amazing athlete. Like I, you, first and foremost, like you can't take that away from him. Like it's not, there, there's not much more to it than that. Like he's has, since he's come, what 2014 was his first games. Uh, every year he's gotten better, and that's his job, and that's our, all of our jobs. And he's just done it better than everybody else has. Uh, I think that he comes and he, if he finds a weakness, he fixes it. He doesn't waste any time, and he he makes sure that you, if you beat him one, if you beat him at something, or you beat him one way, you will not beat him the same way twice. Uh, he I, he's that kind of guy, and I mean that's that's a testament to him and his training and his mindset. I I just there's there's not much else to it than that. I think that to beat him, say, like in the regional standings this year, like I beat him in the overall like combined regional thing where you have a lot of outliers who can pop into the leaderboard and shuffle it up. And that's, that's what happened is because of, I think just event one, the triple three, um, he had, there was a lot of people that snuck in ahead of him on that one and shuffled him down the leaderboard. And that's how you have to beat him in the competition. Like the games is that you need a field of 40 men to all be very good. Um, you can't have 10 guys be good. Because when if if somebody missteps, like if, if he makes a mistake, he needs to pay for it. You need to make sure that like if he has a whatever a couple of no reps or or falls in a handstand walk, five guys pass him, ten guys pass him, not one guy. Because if he's finishing second instead of first in every event, you're not going to beat him in points. That's how this sport works. Like he plays the game very very well, um, and that's how I mean this year. That was one of the fun things I got to do this year, having not had Matt in my regional was to just play that role and see what that's like to dictate the pace and the speed of the competition to whatever you want to do. Um, you can go, okay, well, I'll I'll go here. Like I'm, I'm going to attack here. This is my plan. If one guy beats me, that's not a big deal because he's not going to beat me at any other event in the rest of the weekend. Mm -hmm. So if you can do that and, and take nothing but seconds and thirds, like you still win. And you right. win by a massive margin. And that's what he does very well is he just like he, he's – He's tidied up everything so that, I mean, even on a bad day, he's finishing top 10 in almost everything. So it's, and that's how you have to do. You have to play the, play the game the way he plays it and just do it a little bit better and make less mistakes. I think the closer you can get your training to that level where now, again, even if you're, you're a little beat up, you're a little tired, you did something or like you can afford a mistake here or there and still finish top 10. Um, now it becomes an, it becomes an execution competition and it becomes more like whatever you watch the average professional sport and it's less about who the better team is it's more about who the better team is that day right and now it becomes a real competition of like you need to show up for four days and it's not it's not set in stone it's about who can show up and execute to the best of their potential on all four of those days and that's going to be the winner and i think that'll be cool and we're trying to get there but right now he's just a little bit ahead of us right uh, and i've yeah i mean I, I I want nothing more than to make him have to sweat on the last event. Like sure. nothing more in this world. Like nothing would make me happier than to watch than to beat him next year and let him not get four in a row. Right. And just steal that from him. Like I'd love that. <laughs> just out of spite. It would be amazing. But it's just like I've got a lot of work to do and I know that. Um and I think that he knows that I'm 
I'm willing to do it. So he's going to be working his ass off too. And that's just like, that's how this works. You're trying to hit a moving target and it's not easy. Yeah, man. I appreciate the kind of open, honest answer. Like the first part of that was the it's and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like the best, the best we have now is hope he does poorly in at least one. And there's enough, the competition is solid enough that he really has to pay for it. Now, what's it going to take for you to just beat him straight up at his own game where you're in that same position where even on your worst event, you're still placing top 10? What changes in your training or mindset or whatever it may be do you have to make? Um, I, I need to fix a couple of things. I not fix a couple of things. I need to improve upon a couple of things because I still have a, a couple outlying performances that I think that he'll – beat me on consistently like things like the swim events where he's still finishing top 10 and i was like 20th this year um that stuff needs to get short up a little bit i need to tighten that up and i know what those things are and i'm I'm gonna get better at them um one of my big challenges is just juggling my time because i'm not competing i'm not training full time um i don't have my like, whole support crew cooking my meals and doing everything for me like i have to live my own life and do my own laundry and take care of myself. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm going to need, I'm going to need like more time. I think frankly, it's just, it takes time to build capacity. It takes time to build strength. And I think I've been making the right progress every year since 2015. And it's just, you just need time. Um, I think that I, I, I compete differently than he does. Um, I don't know if that's a bad thing. I, I'm a little bit more, I don't know. I'm a little more observant and calculated, I think, than he is. I think that he competes very passionately. I mean, he's like a wildfire, and he just will go straight forward and blow through everything in his way. Um, and I must let much less that way. And I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it depends on the circumstance. But I think the more we compete and the more exposure we get to each other, we'll see. Uh, I don't know. I'm... I'm I just, like I said, I think I need a little more time and uh, a little bit, I don't know, we'll see. I graduate in, in May, so maybe I'll give him a good run for his money for a couple of years. There you go, man. Yeah, I think it was, it, it's interesting that when the points, so the points were really, t- or they were tighter than usual at some point this year. I can't remember exactly at what point of the games, but we saw him make more errors than I've ever seen him make. And so... I think if if your execution is on point, like you were just talking about, it would be really interesting to see how he responds. If he makes even more mistakes as the pressure increases, as the weekend gets, you know, as it gets later and later in the weekend and the pressure increases, um, yeah. how that might fare. I mean, I agree with you. I had this conversation with someone actually just the other night um, talking about that. And they, I think their point was that the only time we've seen him have pressure on him uh, was in 2015 and he didn't win. Um, he he kind of made some mistakes in the last day and ended up taking second. But I, I agree that I think he, he competes from, from a position of power and a position of comfort and I don't think he does well outside of that. Um, and that's where, like, I, I mean... I've competed in about as uncomfortable a position as you possibly can for like a couple of years now. And so I think that I have a little more experience in that domain than he does. And I think if we can step into my ring, it might be a little bit different, but that's on me to put him there. Like I, I can't, I can't hope that he just makes so many mistakes that he ends up in a, a bad points position. Cause he just won't. Uh, if you, do, if you're going to wait on other people to make mistakes, like it's, you're not going to win. Right. So I need to, I need to, I just need to be better for at everything for a little bit. And, and hopefully, yeah, I agree. If we see him in a tight position on the last day, I'd be interested to see what happens. Like I want to see, I want to see Matt worried. I want to see him sweat. Cause I mean, and I, I don't want to like everybody's, there's all those videos of him like throwing up and garbage cans before events. He's like, he's a bit of an anxious competitor, but I mean, that would be, I mean, I think that, that, that's how you would beat him in the end is that you would need to have him in a vulnerable position going into the last day. And then I think that he may crumble a little bit or make mistakes because he's not as practiced in that position as maybe some other athletes are. So we'll see. I like see I said, a I thousand guess. memes being made out of this. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, like I said, I, I've, like, I've made all the mistakes and I have figured out how to, how to make it right. But, um, I mean, yeah, you, you do see it from time to time and it's interesting to see how he reacts to making mistakes because he doesn't make a lot of them, frankly. Right. Um, so you you have, you make a good point. And I think that at the end of the day, that's likely a big component of it. So let's switch gears, man. Um, a couple weeks ago, Greg Glassman announced some fucking huge changes to the CrossFit Games format. He did it initially. I can't remember the first the first spot, but then he did a podcast with the Girls Gone Wad, and then he did a phone call with Arm and Hammer. Where, where? First off, how does how do you feel about the changes? Like excited, scared, angry, feel, and then where's your head at? What are you thinking? Um, my like initial knee jerk reaction is that I'm slightly annoyed. Um, mostly just because there are no details yet. Uh, it's a, it's a, such a waiting game. Uh, and I think so what, what we want as athletes is to be able to make a plan for the year, particularly for me, where in the past bunch of years, my off season is spent, it revolves a lot around school and making sure that everything's lined up so that when competition season rolls around, I can do what I need to do to compete and go back to the games and be successful. And now that's sort of been taken away kind of like maybe we don't know because we don't know when these competitions are. We don't know how many there are. We don't know what's going on. So I don't, I can't actually plan my year out, which makes a big difference for me because I'm not just competing. Um, so I find it frustrating from that perspective. Um, I think it's going to be based on what the proposed changes are again, because there's no, we don't have any official calls on anything that's actually happening. Um, I think it's a very rich gets richer scenario, which is unfortunate for a lot of athletes. I think the old format where everybody got one chance, you got one life, you make it to regionals, you have your one shot, and if you make it, great. If you don't, you're out. That was There's something beautiful about that format. And, it, and by the time you make it to the last day of the games, the last heat, every athlete that's been on that competition floor has done the same test. And the winner is whoever excelled the most at all of those tests. It could be 30 tests by the time you make it there. Um, but now you may end up with so-and-so qualifies from whatever event, this guy qualifies from whatever event, this guy qualified from here. We haven't done any of the same tests, but we're all at the, at the same games now, which is a bit weird. This guy, he made, went to his event, he didn't qualify, so he went to three more and just kept buying extra lives, and then he finally qualified. Um, but 30 other athletes don't have the luxury of being able to do that because they don't have the sponsorship or they don't have whatever. Um, but just because you were in the past were a top 10 games athlete and you have some sponsors at your back, I can just keep losing and keep buying back into the game. Um, I think that that's a little bit frustrating. Um, and I think that there's very clear losers and clear winners as far as like the na the nation thing, like the U S athletes all lose, uh, frankly. And, I think the U.S., probably Canada, Iceland, Australia are the biggest losers. Mm -hmm. um, most other countries have a, have a pretty clear top couple athletes, maybe. Uh, so it's it's interesting. Like, I, and I think that the the proposition of having all the nations go is is cute, but it's I don't know if it works because you're going to have a certain amount of self selection where so-and-so qualifies from this small country, but they can't afford to come all the way to the games to try to compete. Um, so nobody goes from there. Or let's say they do go and then they get knocked out by a minimum work requirement on day one. Like how good was that for their community? Was it actually beneficial? Um, I think that overall the change is going to reduce the level of competition at the games. Um, but again, that's, just my perspective I, I don't know i think that it, it will depend it will depend what happens like when we have more information maybe there are safeties in place that stop certain things that i think are going to happen but right now we don't know because we just have no information so i think that that's just frustrating i've like and we've it's been the talk of the town forever right like we've been all everybody speculating everybody doing everything and i don't i don't like speculating i think that it's a waste of energy and a waste of time and i, I have better things to do with my time than think of the 10 scenarios that could come out of this. Um, 
So it's just been like a very, it's kind of like an exercise in futility to just sort of like sure. sit here and think about everything. So it's interesting. I, I understand what they're trying to say. I understand where they're coming from. I think that if this is the way of the future, it will take years for this structure to likely bear fruit, which may be the only way. Like it may be that that's just how it has to be. There needs to be a- What do you mean bear fruit? Like let's say for the first five years of running this structure, the small countries keep sending athletes to the games that just get crushed and uh, sent home after a day. And it maybe it does really fuel their their community and it does really grow it. And you see a massive amount of more affiliates going worldwide. And then in 10 years, all of a sudden, these small countries are sending really strong athletes. But I don't think it's going to happen in a year or two years or three years. I think that there's just going to be small countries that send athletes uh, into this fight that are just cannon fodder and they just get smashed. Don't you, don't you think that's it sounds like to me that the goal is not about having a more competitive CrossFit. It's about having more affiliates and having it be a more interna- international company at the affiliate level. Right. So I, th- I would assume that they're taking that 10 plus year approach. Yeah, I think it's funny, though, that for the last decade there's been this clear divide between the CrossFit games and the CrossFit affiliate community. And we, and everyone says it like, it's not the same thing. Like the affiliates and the games, like this is not the same thing. Um, but now all of a sudden it's the same thing. And now the games has to be made for the, the community at large. And it, it just, it seems funny that there's been this dramatic switch when in the past it's been adamantly said that this is not, the games is not representative of the affiliate community. Like this is a, a totally different beast. And now all of a sudden it, it's the same again. Right. Um, well, so we're so mixing, I, I think we're just mixing. Like you and I understand that and hear, like we've heard that message, like it's not the same. I wonder yeah. though, and I, I just have to assume part of the reason that they made that decision is because the CrossFit population at large, quote unquote, is not aware of that message. Um, it was only like, I think it was only this year that they had that CrossFit health, like commercial yeah, playing sure. all year long. Uh, before that, I could see it being really hard for people that aren't like kind of at the center of the CrossFit games world or, or CrossFit.com world kind of missing that message. I, I, I think it would be really easy to see them as the same thing as like all affiliates are doing CrossFit games programming. And that's what you see in a lot of boxes still today like Mm -hmm. very competitive programming and that could be and i mean like it's easy for me to have a a bias from the position that i'm in right like i'm i'm clearly in the center of one side of it Mm -hmm. um so it's yeah like that that could be that maybe it's like i said maybe it is the the best thing that's ever going to happen but um there's certainly there's certainly going to be some growing pains, um, particularly in this first year where it's like a half transitional year where likely the, the structure that they proposed will only half come true because of the time, the time constraints of making these changes. Um, so it's going to be like a hybrid year. And then the next year will actually be the first year of the, the full reorganization. Um, but yeah, so it'll be interesting. I I'm, I'm sure that, there's going to be a lot of broken hearts and there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff that happens mm-hmm. in the next year. But, uh, and yeah, I think that it'll likely take a, a, there's been a lot of, I mean, there's so many athletes that are full-time competitors now. And I think it's going to take the motivation away from that because there's less, less likelihood, I guess, of, of qualifying. Yeah. There's less. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the one other thing that is an irony of the whole thing is that, um, if it's meant to drive the CrossFit community side is that most of these sanctioned events that are going to, or events that will become sanctioned that are the big off season CrossFit events in the past have actually done a tremendous job of promoting CrossFit community, but now they won't because they're going to have to take their focus away from their like team of three, like community team structure, because they're going to have to make space for their CrossFit sanctioned uh, individuals and teams, which are now going to take over the, the event because there's something on the line now. Right. So your events that, that in the past have been awesome events for, for community and the, these fitness festivals are now not, I, I think they're going to lose a massive part of that component of themselves. Yeah, I could see so that. Now you're, you're taking, you're taking, let's say 16 events that could have been massive community building events. You're getting rid of those 
in lieu of making one community building event at the CrossFit Games, which like, I don't know, is that is that what the point was? Like, I, I don't know. So that's sort of, there's a lot of little things like that. And, and maybe that's not the way it, it goes. And maybe, like I said, they, there's some safety nets and they have plans that are going to gonna change that. But um, those are just like little having had again having had this conversation far too many times probably sure. at this point they're like little things that we've thought of that are like oh well what about this what about this and there's it's easy to poke holes from far away as well i'm sure that they're doing the best they can to make things operate in a way that makes all parties involved as happy as they can but it can't be easy i mean there's like there's just going to be there's going to be people who are unhappy without a doubt sure. and i mean it doesn't make my life any easier like i I have to compete now in the off season. I have to to shorten my off season. I have to compete more, travel more uh, when I'm trying to work or try to win the open, which is not likely for me. Um, there's some really good athletes in Canada. Like I have no guarantees to to punch my ticket in any of the avenues that are available. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be an interesting. It's going to be a very interesting year. Yeah, I. I think personally, the the overall goal, like the end goal that they say they're striving for really resonates with me and I support it. The way that they're going about it, um, I, re- I, don't, I don't know if I support. And, and I think they left a ton of people out to dry, not only games athletes or things like that, but their own employees, um, it seems like, or were just kind of left hanging out to dry. And... I would just assume that what they're saying is true. Like they they leaked a lot of money in putting on regionals and they, they are desperate to prevent that from happening. So they have to, they have to let everybody know as in as far as, and in, in as far as advanced as possible, but they themselves don't have all of the pieces together. That's what I got to believe. That That's what the problem is right now. I think is that this, this change proposition basically came so off the cuff that there was no time for preparation and whereas in the whereas maybe in a another world you you say okay well you have this conversation behind closed doors you say we're going to make these changes how do we make this happen you make a plan then you make the announcement and now you can give people information instead there was an announcement with no plan and now there's a two-month period of radio silence where everybody is pining for information and panicking and they're just it hasn't been the pieces haven't been put in place yet like they're still figuring out logistically how this is going to work and so they're they're doing their best to get the information out as quickly as they can but there's just like there's so many pieces involved that um it's just a slow process right so so now you've left like the masses high and dry like waiting for information and everyone and that's what like then the rumor mill gets churning and everything's like out of control there's hysteria right so that's what i mean it's like until they're they're gonna do what they're gonna do and until that time it's sort of like you just have to sit on your hands and wait right and uh it's annoying but it's it is what it is and it's not anything that i I say or do is not going to change the decision that they're going to make so i have to just be confident and comfortable in what they're going to do and what they're going to do is what they're going to do and it's going to be okay it's going to be right for their plan and their vision that they have and then at the end of the day i just have to try to be fit again next year and hope that i'm fit enough to compete right um you know there's this one mine. there's this there's this unique one maybe two year competitive advantage that you'll never have again which is just navigating through this period of uncertainty with confidence and ease some people are going to freak out and they're going to um they're going to blame crossfit and they're going to spend all of their mental energy focusing on how pissed off they are and how and unconsciously just being afraid of you know what's going to happen while others are going to notice that that could that's a possibility and they're just going to keep training their ass off and they're not going to give a shit and they're just going to realize that they're going to do as well as they can with the given chances that they have. That's a huge, huge competitive advantage. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, not a lot changes. Like, I'm, I don't go to competitions to lose. Like, if I'm going to show up to an event, I'm going to try to win it anyways. So I, that's the same. Like, if I win this event, it gets me to the games, then sweet. But um, 
not a lot changes in the training. Like you're still going to try you maybe if you maybe have to pick your competitions and periodize differently, but what, as far as like your training is concerned, like you're going to try to peak when you want to peak to be your best at this competition and punch your ticket the same way you would have at a regional or whatever. And, uh, it's just you just have to try to be fit again. It, it, the goal is still the same for everybody, and I mean the other the other reality for me is that um, I still I'm still working and doing school, and if I don't go to the games and I have to focus on work for a year, then like it's not the end of the world. Like I I, I still have other things that I'm doing, and, and like I'm sure many other people do. It's easy to become short sighted, but you have to be okay with the fact that like if things if something doesn't go well or whatever, for some reason you get hurt. Like that stuff happens to athletes every year. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you going to do for that year? Like this has been a reality that athletes have faced for a long time. So if, if you just don't make it for one reason or another, like you need to be okay that your year's not wasted. Like you, you have other things that you can do. You can make another plan. You can move forward. Um, it is certainly, I think that the fear is paralyzing for some people. Um, and I think that's just, you have to find your way to get through that. And, uh, just keep training for it because i don't know the changes are coming whether you want them or not yep so a lot of people that uh sent questions in asked something like this so millie cornejo asked how do you manage to work full time and still train at a games level do you have any like strategies uh for time management prioritization how do you do it uh, I do have some, but I would say that the disclaimer is that my strategies are my strategies, and I think that they won't necessarily work for everybody. So um, I think the biggest thing for me right now, so I work I work three days a week, and the other two days, three days, I, I have classes and courses and assignments and things that I'm responsible for. So um, I, I'm like, I've always been pretty good in school, so I don't actually... I don't attend most of my lectures. I just learn on my own time when I have time. That allows me to say on a day where I have five, six hours of lecture, I can go train in the morning, go to the library for three hours, go train in the afternoon and get the same amount of work done. Um, when I decide to be diligent and focused in my train in my studies, I am. And when I decide to do so in my training, I am. I don't leave a lot of space in my days for distractions when I need to be very busy and diligent i just do it i don't do very well doing the same thing for a really long time so if that means i do i train for three hours i study for three hours i train for three hours i study for three hours then that's what i do um and i think that as an adult you just need to figure out how you work best and i've been a student for a long time and i've just sort of learned the best strategies for myself that are like this is how i work best i need to I need to go lock myself in my room or I need to go to the library or I need to whatever, get out of the house. Uh, I need to chunk my days into small blocks. Like I, I've learned that about myself that maybe my time's not spent as good in lecture as it is in a library and I'll just do that. I do whatever I need to do to maximize my output in the hours that I have. And then it gives me extra time to train and do whatever. Um, and I think it's just, it's like finding a way to to keep doing that and just get your engine started. Like the hardest thing sometimes is just to get moving and the first thing, but like checking boxes to me is like, you can get high off checking things off your to-do to -do list. Sure. Like it just, it's, it's so good and you generate momentum in productivity. So I find that like once you're doing something, you get on like a roll with your productivity and, and you can just ride that and go. So on days where I have a lot of things to do, like maybe I'll start in the morning by just like doing a ton of dishes and like, cleaning the room, throw some things in the laundry, like, oh man, I've already done three things on my to-do list. Okay, I'm gonna knock out an assignment. Okay, I'm gonna go to the gym. Okay, now I'm gonna do this, whatever, for two hours, like study for two hours. And you just like, if you don't let yourself delay and come down between things, you can really roll through a lot of stuff really fast. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of hours in a day. Like you can, if you don't spend 30 minutes in between everything that you do, you just go straight into the next thing and like go and do it. And I try to like, split up my energies in different ways where I might do one thing that requires a lot of focus and mental energy and another thing that doesn't it's what's a it's a physical benign tedious task that like I it won't take any brain power it's just going to take time like I'm just going to pick things up off the floor right. and move into the garbage like and that could and be you rejuvenating could, mentally absolutely absolutely and then you come back and your your brain is fresh again you didn't think for the last two hours and you can just do something that's more mentally taxing again um 
and I find that 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 mental strength is is hard. Like that's a, a precious resource, and the more you can save it, the better. So finding even just habit forming is good for that. Like it'll save your mental strength if you just develop a good habit over like thirty days, and then now you don't ever have to think about that again. You just do it, and now it's fine. You don't you wake up in the morning and like you you you've already meal prepped the night before because you've just been doing that forever. Like now I don't have to think about making breakfast or making coffee when I'm tired. It's just easy. It's done. And you just, that sort of stuff super important. And the other thing I've found is that the more you can try to delegate tasks, the better things are going to be. Um, I know it's not a luxury that everybody has or can afford, but from my position, something as simple as like my like programming or my whatever, like I, I trust Michelle 100% with my programming and I, she will send me the week's worth of programming. I'll spend an hour asking her every question I can possibly think of for the week of like what the goals are, what the targets are, what is this, how do you want this done, how do you want that done? And once I have all the information, I don't have to think. I show up to the gym, I do exactly what I'm told and I leave. Like that's it. I don't have to spend a single extra thought. I just show up. I perform to the best of my ability. I do my job and I leave. And my job is not something right there real quick. I want to highlight something because a lot of people think that being a good student is simply doing what they're told. And a little nuance in there that you just said is first you identify what the intent of every piece of that entire week is. So you know why you're doing what you're doing. And that's, I think that is absolutely key in being a great student, um, a great follower, whatever you want to call it is understand, like taking ownership of understanding why you're doing what you're doing rather than just being a cog in the wheel and just doing what you're told. I think you get a much different intensity when you do, when you do, when you know why. Yeah. You're more invested as well. It's sort of, it gets you involved. It means that I'm involved in our programming and that's part of our relationship, but I don't, my job is not to do the programming. My job is to, or not to like make the program. My job is to do the programming. So she does her side and then I go on my side and I do it to the best of my ability and maybe we'll give feedback afterwards or rundown, but that's it. Like I don't, I don't have to think about how I'm going to periodize my week. I don't have to think about how I'm going to make this triplet work or what time domains I want to hit. Like that stuff's not off my plate. It's done. I have a, a friend of mine uh, who's a nutritionist and she works with me and, and does my helps me with my nutrition targets. And so I don't have to think about that. I don't, and, and we worked together to, so that I could not just have macro goals, but she would build like small meal structures to be like, okay, you're going to have this many grams of carbs, this many grams of protein, this many grams of, of fats at this meal. Like this is what that would look like. And she's like, okay, so eat, you're going to eat three eggs and a half a cup of oatmeal and an apple. And like every morning I will just do that. It makes it so my grocery shopping is mindless. My breakfast, my, my like meal prep is mindless. Like everything is just done. I don't care. It doesn't bother me if I eat the same thing every single day. Like it, it doesn't matter to me one bit. It, it's just one less thing I have to think about and I will just do it and it's totally fine and it's done. So those sorts of things I are just super valuable. The more you can, t- the more you can take off your plate or find ways to take things off your plate, the more you can save that that thought energy for whatever else. But because I don't have to think about programming or eating or like what am I going to make for dinner today, I can spend all that energy when I have like work to do and I have assignments, I need to be focused, I need to do stuff. I, I can work more diligently for longer um, and then just whatever, autopilot through the rest of the stuff that I can autopilot through. Um, and that is super duper valuable for me. Um, when I had one more, that's a pretty good one, but let me think here for a sec. I lost it. Yeah, think about it for a sec. I think I think what you're saying is amazing. And if you're someone listening that doesn't doesn't have like a great sense of self awareness, like when when Pat is saying this, nothing comes to mind. Like how you like to get work done and how you like to split up your day. Uh, I encourage you just to journal about it. Journal about the times that you felt most rejuvenated and energized to do each individual task that you have in your life and journal about the times in which you felt like you had the lowest energy and see if you can find some themes, see if you can find some, um, just strategies in there while you're writing that show you how you should set up your day. Oh, and one on that is like, um, that, that 
like some doing completing small tasks to give yourself energy like it it honestly i can't stress enough how energizing it is to like have a small to-do list and just like knock a few things off that are very easy simple small tasks that won't take long but you'll see an immediate return for like just like so doing the dishes and all of a sudden there's an empty sink and you're like, yeah, nice. Take the garbage out. Like this is sweet. It's done. And those will take you like you could do three things that will take you less than 10 minutes and then you'll just feel like you're getting things done and it makes you feel good and you feel productive and then it's so much easier to jump into the next task, like 100 times easier. I just um, picture you like locking yourself in your room, almost like you're huffing paint and you're just checking boxes. Like you're creating <laughs> these little like uh, meaningless tasks in your room and you just check in the boxes, just get. Yeah. You like you get the sheet out and you're like, create checklist, <laughs> check. And then like <laughs> it's but actually, though, it's, it's it's funny to say, but like you and you totally do like I'm like creating small jobs for myself just so that I can then complete them and feel productive. And it like, it's, it's funny, but it's, it's actually you, I'm sure if you talk to a lot of people who do like, I don't know, who are into like how to be more productive, they'll tell oh, you the this same is thing. very like, well studied. What you're talking about is very well studied. Yeah, it's it's one totally of the most common strategies endorsement. in all of those books. Yeah. It's amazing. And you just, you absolutely like, I don't care. Create yourself, like throw stuff on the ground so that you can pick it up. Like it's, it's will actually make you feel like you've done something tangible, something that you can actually like see the, the completed task. Like if it's, if it's work, like, I don't know, even if it's something that's fairly intangible, like you're doing uh, whatever, let's say you're a writer and you're writing a novel and like you, you write like however many words and it's hard to really see cause it's a drop in the bucket. Then you don't get the same effect. But like if you have a full inbox of emails and you read all the emails and just like that inbox thing goes from 20 to zero, you're like, nice, email's done. And it, it makes you feel really good. So the more tangible the task, the better the effect is going to be. Like when you can physically see that like, man, there was all these leaves on the ground. Now there's none. Like it's awesome. It makes you feel great. Um, the last one that what it was was uh, was just planning. Like simple organization is so overlooked. Like when I talk about like trying to jump quickly from one task to another and not wasting that time in transition um one of the easiest ways to do that is to like i look at my schedule the night before and i say okay like what time do i have to be at work what do i have to do after work what time do i have to train what time where does everything fit and you put all the pieces together wherever they fit and then i'm like all right so what time i have to wake up at this time i'll eat here i'm going to be at work at this time i'm going to be at work till then i'm going to eat again there i'm going to be at at the gym here and then you can you can slice everything in as closely as you want and it just makes it it makes everything flow so much nicer when you've looked at that already once like if i wake up the next day and then i'm trying to i'm being reactionary and i'm trying to plan it and i'm trying to be like okay i get home from work like well now what time do i have to be at the gym like oh well i have to eat still like let me just and then you're going to do that and you're you're constantly playing catch up it feels like Whereas if I already know I'm walking home from work and I'm like, good, my meal's in the fridge, I'm going to eat that, I'm going to change my shorts, I'm going to go to the gym, and I can be in and out of the house in less than 10 minutes. And it's just like, it makes you so much faster and more efficient with your time. Uh, and just like so the simple fact of just looking ahead of time and having that, you don't even need to write it down, just have that look at your schedule and say, okay, here's where all the pieces fit, and I know, I know what tomorrow looks like as a whole, and it just, it makes it so easy to just roll through everything. There's great advice. Uh, I heard, I heard a quote or I read a quote that goes something like 10 minutes of planning can save you two hours a day. Yeah, absolutely. Accurate. Tiny I don't know whoever said that, but smart man yep. or woman. All right, brother, we've already gone over time. This has been so, so good, man. Thank you so much for your time. Um, anything uh, else pleasure. you want to leave these guys with before we get out of here? Oh, I don't know. Nothing really, but Good luck to everybody trying to pack their days full and get as fit or as functional as they possibly can. There's a lot of hours in a day. You just got to figure out how to use them to the best of your ability. Yeah, and it sounds like one of the messages that you're sending is be a little more conscious about how you're how you're spending your day, right? You, you, two of your pieces of advice. One was to just become more aware of how you like to get things done, and that can be work related that can be in relationships that can be you know personal hobbies and and fitness related but just be a little more conscious and the second one was really similar which is just have a little like add a little bit of preparation a little bit can go a long way so i love that man yeah for sure it's like awareness and ownership are huge and i think that the more that you're try to reflect on like why you why things didn't 
run smoothly today or what happened or whatever and take ownership over that and say that yeah you can change something or fix something to make things better um the awareness is massive like i think it's so easy to just forget or just like coast through and not really uh really like to to feel like things just happen to you like make things happen you know boom nice man okay where can people find you at pasty white crossfitter (laughs) <laughs> pretty much i might actually change my handle to that but uh no i'm probably the best way is my instagram is uh just at p velner uh on twitter as well but i don't really tweet that much it's pat it's at pat velner on twitter that's v-e-l-l-n-e-r but, yeah two l's a surprising amount of people get that wrong still well <laughs> appreciate you man have a great day thanks a lot mike This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW. 